Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is James Watson, and I look after marketing and student recruitment at the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific. Uh, welcome to another session for ANU Virtual Open Week. Uh, I'm coming to you tonight from my home on Ngunnawal land, so I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, who are the traditional owners of the land on which I am, and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement to the traditional owners of the, all the lands we're meeting on wherever we are in Australia. The focus on the Asia Pacific is a defining feature of the Australian National University. Uh, and in our college, we're lucky to be surrounded by over 300 experts in a wide variety of disciplines. Among those disciplines uh, is some world-class expertise in politics, international affairs and Asia Pacific culture. So tonight's session will focus on some of the programs we teach in these areas. Tonight, we're very lucky to be joined by a really top class panel of esteemed academics. We have Dr. Bethwin Evans, Dr. Lauren Richardson, Professor Ed Aspinall, and Dr. Cecilia Jacob. Uh, I'm also joined by some wonderful professional colleagues. So between us, we'll be able to answer any, uh, any and all of the questions you have. Uh, so this is a Q&A session as well. Uh, so the way that it'll work tonight is that our four academics will present about the programs that they teach into. And that'll go from anywhere to, from 30 to 40 minutes. And then after that, you'll have an opportunity to ask your questions. Uh, so please use the Q&A function below. Uh, if, uh, and then you can type out your question and then we'll come to them at the end. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass over to Dr. Bethan Evans to get us started. Thanks, Beth. Hey, thanks very much and welcome everyone. It's lovely to see so many people here, even though this format means I can't see you. Um, so my name's Bethwin and I'm a linguist in the College of Asia and the Pacific and I find it a really exciting and special place um, to work because it's an environment that fosters connections and collaborations across different disciplines and across different regions of expertise. And that's both in research and in teaching. So my own research is as a linguist, so I work on languages in Papua New Guinea, in Bougainville and Papua New Guinea, and also in the western part of the Solomon Islands, documenting languages um, that are only known within the communities um, that speak them. And also looking at the ways in which um, we can use contemporary languages to reconstruct the histories of the speech communities that speak those languages today. Um, and I'm also the convener of the Masters of Asian and Pacific Studies, and that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about here. So I'll just share my screen. Um, so I hope you can see that. Um, so the Master of Asian and Pacific Studies, um, which we also call the MAPS um, degree, in case I use the acronym by accident, as it's the one that we use so frequently. Um, and I'm the convener of that um, program. So this is a two year or four semester um, coursework program. But it also has the option of converting um, to what we call the advanced MAPS um, program. And that means that for the final semester, instead of taking a set of courses, you do a single course which involves working on an independent research project and presenting that as an MA thesis. Um, so the aim of the, the Master of Asian and Pacific Studies um, is to help students build their own unique regional expertise um, in Asian and Pacific studies. So through deep knowledge and innovative research and to develop nuanced understandings of national and transnational developments regarding people, technologies, languages and ideas across the region and also the region on the global scale. So students come into um, the MAPS program um, for a number of different reasons. So our students often have very um, different reasons for choosing to study in the Masters of Asian and Pacific Studies. Um, some students are just wanting to deepen their knowledge of the region um, and their understanding of, of the region and its connections with Australia and the rest of the world. Um, others are wanting to gain um, expertise on specific nations or areas within the Asia Pacific region. Um, many of our students, one of their goals is to develop language skills in one or more Asian language um, and also to gain research experience um, with a focus on the Asia Pacific region. And equally, um, our MAPS students have also have very diverse career paths um, after graduating. 
So working in government departments with links in our broader region, um, non-government organisations, both big and small, often with a focus on development projects um, within the region, in marketing, in media, um, and also in business, especially connected with trade. Um, so I think one of the major differences between this program and some of the other MA programs within our College of Asia and the Pacific and also the ANU is the breadth of the program and also the flexibility. So we aim to give graduates skills, knowledge and experiences that are valuable for a range of career paths, um, as well as helping students create their own individualised study program that best suits their interests and their long term goals. Um, and so I just wanted to say a little bit about the structure of um, the MAPS program to give you a bit of an idea of the kind of um, courses you can do and the way the, the program works over the two years. Um, so as I said, the program allows students to gain key skills and knowledge as well as shape the degree around their own interests. Um, so we have a, a set of compulsory courses so all students take these compulsory courses and it's really nice to take them in your first your first year um, and get to know other MAPS students. So I really notice in my classes that the MAPS students form a, a really tight cohort um, and a very supportive one, which is really nice to see. Um, so the compulsory courses really focus on key skills and methods in cross-disciplinary approaches from humanities, social sciences and data sciences. So really covering the breadth of um, expertise in analytical methods and skills across the, across the college. These are also the courses that um, aim to provide a strong foundation for developing a more nuanced understanding of the diversity of social and political structures, histories, languages, ideas and technologies across the Asia Pacific region. So giving students a, a sort of broad view um, of the region, but focusing on the diversity across it. Um, and then experience in communicating about the Asia Pacific region in appropriate language or languages. Um, so this is all also where students start to um, learn about language and, and languages in the region. Um, the core courses are a, a set of courses um, that students need to select several from. So it's a, it's a fixed set of courses, um, but there's some selection that students can choose the ones that um, are on particular themes or topics that most interest them. And the aim of these courses is to allow students to develop multidisciplinary and multi-regional knowledge. So still with this focus of um, comparison across disciplines and comparison across regions within the Asia Pacific. Um, as well as gaining deep knowledge of particular intellectual themes that provide the basis then for more specialised studies. Um, so for example, our core courses cover topics like activism and social change, disasters and epidemics, social conflict and environmental challenges, law and justice, and the course that I teach, which is on language and multilingualism and the role that plays in our lives in general. Um, and then also these courses um, aim to sort of take the methods um, and analytical practices that you've been learning and apply them to specific areas. So narrowing down from, from the compulsory courses. And then we have a, a very wide range of what we're calling specialist courses. Um, these are the elective courses um, that students choose the ones that most interest them. And as I said, there's a real wide range of courses um, specialist or elective courses. And this is where students follow their own um, specific interests. But all of these courses aim to pr promote a depth of knowledge and engagement with specific regions. Um, so a lot of our students do China studies or Northeast Asian studies, Pacific studies, South and Southeast Asian studies, um, as well as engagement in particular themes or topics. Um, so like environmental studies, gender and culture, history and culture, linguistics and translation studies, politics and international affairs. Um, it's within the specialised, the specialist courses that students can also develop language skills. So you can do um, a set of um, language courses on a language um, that you're interested in learning or a language that's going to become 
important for, for other research. Um, we have around 13 um, different Asian Pacific languages taught here at ANU. Um, this is also the area where students can undertake experience, experiential courses, so such as um, internships, there's an internship program that students can um, take part in. And this is the specialist courses are where we um, encourage students to cultivate their own voice and um, expertise on a particular um, region or theme. And it's within the specialist courses that students can then go on to um, either do a course um, that's a supervised research project and develop their own um, quite small research project or take on a master's thesis, so a much bigger research project, um, and work with a supervisor um, on their own independent research project. Um, so we have quite a clear structure for the, the Master of Asian Pacific Studies, um, but within that, um, students are able to um, tailor the degree to their own interests and their own long-term goals, and that's something that um, we talk to each student about who, who enters into the program so that we're, we're meeting their goals as well as um, the goals of the program. Um, and that's, that's all I'll, I'll say about the program for now, but um, as James said, there should be plenty of time for questions at the end. Thanks so much, Beth. <clears throat> yeah, so if you've got any questions about uh, the Master of Asian and Pacific Studies or uh, studying um, Asia Pacific culture in general, please pop them in the Q&A. Uh, and next I'm going to hand over to Dr. Lauren Richardson. Uh, good evening everyone, thanks for coming along to our session and I hope you're all doing well in these um, very stressful times. So I'm uh, the convener of two degrees at ANU, one is the Master of Diplomacy and the other is the Master of International Law and Diplomacy. Um, so I guess the first thing I should do is um, tell you what is um, diplomacy as, as a field of study. Um, I'm sure you all have a basic understanding that diplomacy refers to the, the practice, uh, the skill and the activity of managing international relations. Um, it's typically carried out by um, state representatives abroad through embassies, etc. But we take uh, a broader conception of diplomacy in our degrees by looking at the, the vast array of new actors who are getting involved in diplomacy. You could um, broadly call these non-state actors. So they include even um, celebrities. Um, they include um, non-state uh, non -state actors like NGOs, um, and other organization. Um, and there's even, um, you know, the challenge of um, state representatives having to negotiate with non-state actors um, who are also playing a prominent role in diplomacy, like um, um, I guess you could say like um, insidious non-state actors like terrorists. Um, so when you study diplomacy, you're basically going to be looking at how foreign policy is implemented. Okay, it's one thing to formulate a foreign policy, but it's another thing to then um, you know, get another country to agree to allow you to, to implement that policy or to, to, to agree to it. So the kind of skills we study are negotiation, um, which is important for that, and also conflict resolution. So when problems arrive, um, arise in relationships, how do you manage them? So in our Master of Diplomacy, that's a 1.5 year degree, um, you'll basically study a range of core subjects. Um, we've tried to keep these at a minimum to allow you to do um, as many ele electives as you, you'd like. Um, you'll get a foundation of you know, what diplomacy is about. You'll cover a whole range of diplomatic problems, mostly in the context of the Asia Pacific. We have uh, regional experts. I work on Northeast Asia um, specifically. Um, we also have experts on the, who work on the Pacific Islands uh, region. So you'll get a broad understanding of actual disputes. Um, a lot of students ask the question of, you know, how is diplomacy different than from international relations? And you're gonna hear more about international relations from my colleague, um, Dr. Jacob soon, but, um, 
I will just briefly say that, you know, we, we focus in diplomacy less on the theoretical side of understanding in international relations and focus more on the practical side. And I don't mean that it's an actual practical degree, okay? Um, we do have practical elements of it, um, but we look at how, you know, um, diplomacy is practiced in how um, disputes are resolved in practice, okay? Rather than more from an empirical standpoint um, that, than a theoretical one. Um, we also offer the opportunity to do a diplomatic internship. A lot of our students take up placements at embassies in Canberra, um, but there's some flexibility with that. And we also have another practical element to the degree where we do a negotiation workshop. Uh, we have an expert come in who's been, he's had a whole very long career in Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and they come in and teach you the, the ins and outs of how to negotiate. So you're probably aware that, you know, when countries make, even countries that have good relationships, when they try to make new agreements with one another, where, whether they be trade agreements, free trade agreements, or even defense agreements, um, what often happens is they, they come to a sort of a standstill where they, they can't, or an impasse where they can't sort of agree on one matter and it holds the negotiations up for years. So we look at what kind of tactics you can use to break through um, those impasses and basically how you can facilitate um, better relations and reach agreements. And we also have the option in that degree of um, a thesis, a research thesis. So anyone who wants to go on to do maybe a PhD or just wants to be able to say on, have on their CV that they've done research um, should take this 1.5 um, year degree. And we also offer the option of undertaking foreign languages as electives, um, as you can in the MAPS degree, because we realize that obviously foreign languages are very important for the practice of diplomacy. Um, the other degree is our new two-year degree. It's Master of International Law and Diplomacy. Um, so both of these fields, this kind of double major, um, you could say they're both specializations, they're both subfields. So diplomacy is a subfield of international relations, international law is a subfield of law. Um, but we realize that these two subfields really go hand in hand. Um, as you probably know, much of our international movement, <laughs> almost everything that happens internationally is governed by international law, even traveling to another country is governed by aviation law. Um, and any kind of disputes that arise internationally often have to be dealt with through that, under that governance framework of international law. But it often comes down to interpretation and it often intersects with domestic law and makes makes matters very complicated to solve even though these um, laws exist so that's where the diplomacy comes in um, if you look at many of the disputes between countries today they relate to treaties like bilateral treaties where they disagree over the original agreement they made um, and so recognizing that these two kind of specialized subfields go hand in hand we've created this degree um, to give you a really strong foundation in both. And we don't offer a, a thesis as part of this degree, so it's not something you would undertake if you, you know, want to become a, a researcher. Um, but we do offer the option of doing a research project, a smaller scale research project, but mostly it's a very intense coursework degree. And the, the kind of graduates um, that we have from this program go into work in multinational organizations. Um, also, we've, we've had obviously people who became actual diplomats, um, some who are already diplomats um, from other countries and just want to improve their, their skill levels. And we also have people who've ended up working in the UN and also some in various organizations in The Hague. Um, so this is kind of an, I guess you could say an executive um, degree that would give you a competitive edge on some of those international um, uh, jobs that require, um, yeah, a high level skill and understanding of diplomacy. Um, that's all I have to, to say, I think. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Lauren. Uh, a reminder too that uh, we're here for you, everyone. We want to be able to uh, give us uh, the best sort of tailored advice we can. So we'd love those questions to keep coming through. Pop them in the Q&A. We'll get to them shortly. And now I'm going to head over to Professor Ed Aspinall. Thanks, Ed. Great. Thanks, James. And nice to meet you all. Um, so um, just to say a little bit about myself before I launch into describing the program. So I'm a, um, a researcher in politics, obviously. Uh, but I'm a specialist in the politics of Southeast Asia, especially Indonesia. So the sort of things that I've um, done research on recently, I recently wrote a book, co-authored a book with a colleague from the Netherlands uh, on vote buying and related practices in Indonesia. So how um, politicians exchange material benefits in order to get elected and how that's organised. Uh, currently involved in a project looking at women politicians uh, in that country, what the obstacles are for them getting elected um, and how um, successful women um, candidates uh, sort of break through those obstacles. So the program I'm going to be talking about today is the Master of Political Science. Um, let me just try and find it here on my screen, share screen, um, which is in fact, um, it sounds strange, but this is in fact the only um, uh, master's program in political science offered in uh, Australia. Here we are. Excuse me for a minute. Get myself organised. Um, and it's been running for a few years now, so it's a relatively pro uh, new program uh, compared to some of the others. Um, now, why um, masters uh, or why the ANU for a masters of political science? Well, one thing that's worth noting here uh, is the ANU actually ranks really strongly internationally uh, in terms of its um, uh, politics and international relations offerings. So this is the latest um, QS uh, rankings of um, various fields of studies uh, internationally. You can see that the ANU actually comes in at number 10 uh, internationally in terms of its uh, political science um, and international relations programs. Um, now, it's a Master's of Political Science and the primary focus of our study and what we, was distinguishes us from the International Relations Masters is that we're primarily interested in domestic politics. So that is the big sort of questions of politics at a within state level. So questions to do with elections, who wins elections, why, what motivates voters when they uh, vote for particular political candidates or parties. Um, why, what, um, questions about regime form and regime change. Why do some countries become democratic and others authoritarian? What sustains authoritarian rule in uh, different parts of, of the world? Um, social movements and how different forms of political movements achieve influence um, and who gets to participate in politics and under what sorts of conditions. So these are sort of questions that um, um, relate to domestic sort of politics. We're not so much interested in relations between states, although that can, of course, uh, come, into, come into it. Um, but when I say domestic politics, that definitely does not mean that we're primarily focused on Australian politics. Um, and part of the background here, you don't have to be concerned uh, with the particular centres that offer, offer this degree, but it's worth noting that it brings together these two different parts of the um, ANU, uh, and the program is run collaboratively by these two different parts of the ANU. One part, the Coral Bell School, which focuses on politics of Asia and the Pacific, that's where I'm located. So we have people, for example, who specialise in the politics of Indonesia, of other Southeast Asian countries, uh, the politics of India, the politics of China and the Pacific Island states, uh, for example, and then colleagues from the other school, the School of Politics and International Relations, many of whom um, specialise in politics of the established democracies of Western Europe, North America, Australia, uh, and so on. So we bring together these, this sort of global perspective uh, on politics, but focusing on those sort of domestic uh, political questions. So the, the, the degree, as I've already touched upon, is really about the study of politics uh, writ, writ large. We touch, we delve into many of the kind of core classical themes of political studies, both historical and contemporary. We have a comparative orientation, so we're looking right across the globe, comparing um, 
why, as I said before, why is it that some countries are becoming authoritarian uh, while others become democratic? What are the big changes that are taking place at the global level uh, in terms of uh, politics? Why do some countries go in one direction uh, and others uh, in another? Um, we also emphasize training in methods and research design. So if you have these interesting questions to ask about politics, um, uh, how do we go about answering them uh, in a rigorous uh, and convincing uh, uh, manner? And like most sort of master's uh, degrees, we also have these opportunities for specialization, uh, including uh, uh, an advanced version of the degree that allows uh, people uh, to do a thesis. I won't go into this in a great detail, but again, it's a sort of a degree structure that in many ways mirrors uh, some of the, the, the structures of the other degrees that we'll, you've been hearing about tonight. Um, so a number of sort of um, required core courses, which focus on core political science subjects and, and on research design and methods. Then there's scope for you to, you know, pick from a wide range of courses right across um, you know, including courses drawn from some of the other degrees. So if you're interested in um, uh, international relations, if you're interested in uh, historical or cultural topics, you can bring in uh, elective courses there. And then, as I said before, the opportunity for a thesis for those who are interested in really delving into a particular topic. And this is, of course, often a pathway to PhD study for those who are interested. Those core subjects I mentioned before, um, uh, focus on these topics. Um, I offer the course on democracy and its discontents, uh, which looks at these, you know, huge questions of political science research. Where does democracy come from? How, uh, how has it developed over the last 20 years? Um, why do some countries uh, retain authoritarian uh, forms of political rule? What sustains them? What are the current trends? How do we account for the rise of uh, populism at the contemporary period uh, in many countries across the world, from the United States to the Philippines. Um, then we have these other subjects, comparative political behaviour, for example, really looks at how we analyse voting patterns, uh, political psychology at the mass level, and so on. The research design and methods courses uh, sound sort of dry, but they're really important and quite interesting. Um, uh, the quantitative research uh, topic, for example, that's for to help people who want to answer questions like who votes for Donald Trump, right? So in order to answer that sort of a question, you need to have some sort of ability to understand voting patterns, um, uh, public opinion surveys, uh, and similar forms of uh, data on a sort of a mass scale. So that's a subject that allows you to sort of develop the skills to make that sort of analysis. Whereas um, qualitative research um, allows you to answer more sort of um, uh, uh, why sort of questions on a sort of a face-to-face -face level. Um, so for example, uh, to mention uh, some of my own research, for example, um, what are the experiences that successful women candidates uh, uh, um, have um, that um, prepare them uh, for a life of politics in my particular research in the Indonesian case. Um, so again, that trains you in the sort of methods you need to be able to answer those sort of face-to-face -face, um, uh, sort of forms of research. And I think that's it. So that gives you a basic overview. Um, so I would stress again that it's a, it's a Masters of Political Science, the only one offered in Australia. Um, and the focus is on domestic politics, but very much at an international level. I'll hand it back. Thanks so much, Ed. That was fantastic. Uh, just another reminder, everyone, um, keep your questions coming in the Q&A uh, and we'll get to them very shortly. And now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Cecilia Jacob. Thanks, Cecilia. Oh, you're on mute. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> um, thanks, James. And I was just saying, I'll, I'll try and keep it brief so we have enough time for Q&A, but um, just to introduce myself, I am a senior lecturer at, um, in the Department of International Relations uh, at the Coral Bell School. So I'm also currently doing an um, uh, Australian Research Council project on the United Nations, looking at the creation of the International Human Protection Order. So I do a lot of work looking at 
the United Nations and doctrines around humanitarian protection and responsibility to protect, um, which and also takes a historical focus as well as a very um, empirical focus in looking how um, the UN unrolls its, its protection program. So that's um, about the, the kind of work that I'm looking at at the moment. But uh, to just get into the IR degree, uh, firstly, what is international relations? So international relations is the study of relationships between states. Uh, it's also the study of how we create order at the international level. So as a discipline, it was really birthed out of this desire to understand um, the problem of global conflict, what creates conflict, um, conflict between states, and over time we've become a lot more attuned to what creates uh, conflict within states. Um, but uh, I guess going off what uh, Ed was saying, we look not at the domestic politics side, but we go up and we have a look at the governance at the international level. So what goes on above the state when there's no single authority above the state, where there's no one legal or judicial system, um, except for the one that, that we create through our own international cooperation, uh, creation of uh, international institutions and regimes at that level. So that's what uh, we focus on in general. Um, to break it down a little bit more is some of the subject matter that you look at in international relations. Uh, we are interested in international conflict and cooperation, uh, international security, so understanding what does security mean, um, how uh, people and nation states would feel insecure and what we, how we can address that at, at the international level. We're interested in global governance. So what does governance mean above the state? Um, who in, engages in governance? And there's strong intersections where um, with what Lauren was talking about in terms of diplomacy, but we tend to look um, at more the meta um, level of, of the governance regimes. International political economy, how it all holds together um, between states and um, across state borders is crucial. In our department, we also have a very strong focus on humanitarianism and peace and conflict. Uh, so that's another dimension that we would focus on. And I guess another thing to say is we are located in the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs. So the Department of International Relations has an interest uh, at politics internationally and, and the theory and the history of, I guess, world making. Uh, but there is also a very strong focus on the Asia Pacific. So many of our faculty are also have expertise um, within different parts of the region. And we bring that lens to bear as uh, how uh, international relations and geopolitics at the international level also shapes the Asia Pacific region and vice versa. So that's, uh, I guess, one distinctive about our program. Um, our department is the oldest department of international relations in Australia, and it's um, also Australia's leading department. So this really is the top program for um, a master's degree in international relations, uh, if you're interested in that subject matter. I'll just quickly bring up for you uh, the degree structure. We have gone through a process of restructuring. Let's see if this is going to work. Yep. Um, we've gone through a process of restructuring our degrees. So these changes yet haven't been reflected on the programs and courses if you've been doing some investigation into it. So I'll just give you a bit of an overview of what the revamped Masters of International Relations is uh, looks like now. Um, it is a 96 uh, unit program. That means it's a two year program and it's separated into four components. The first component is the introductory uh, stage. So this is compulsory for all students doing the 96 degrees. This is uh, a, an introduction to issues and concepts in international relations. So we look at world politics broadly. We take a broad sweep of, um, I guess, an entree into the field and the discipline. And studying international relations is um, an introduction to students of how to read international relations and how to interpret it. If you are applying for the Masters of International Relations and you do have a Cognate degree, you can request um, to have credit um, into the degree program. So if you are offered 24 units of credit on admission, um, 
you are not required to do this introductory component. So we would take the 24 units of credit um, from these courses. But if you don't come from a Cognate discipline, um, this is a really um, useful pathway to get you grounded into the degree. Then we next, we have um, the essential component study requirements. So this grounds you in the discipline. So these 24 units are compulsory. We have international relations theory, evolution of the international system. So this is a, a historical course, uh, global ethics, and then a research methods oriented course. Um, this looks at researching international relations and getting a, you know, some of the nitty gritty kinds of questions and approaches of how we deal with the subject matter, matter in, a, in a deeply ethical or normative way that is emphasized in our department. After completing these 24 units, we then have a specialization. Um, and so we offer three specializations that reflect the strength of our uh, faculty and expertise in the department. So these are world affairs. This is a, a broader degree for those of you who want to be able to, I guess, cover the field from global security to international political economy to uh, foreign policy making. So that's, that's the world affairs specialization. We then have international relations of Asia Pacific that really gets you looking specifically at countries and their foreign policy uh, making and, and challenges and, and so on. And then we have the peace and conflict studies specialization. The last 24 units is very open in terms of where you're able to specialize. So we would allow you to either go much deeper into one of those three specializations that you had selected, or we have extension specializations. So this is either international governance, international political economy, foreign policy analysis, or international security. Uh, otherwise, you do have the component as with the other courses to take a 24 unit thesis. So instead of taking coursework, you would be spending one semester one on one with a one of the faculty members of the department to develop your own research project and that will be supervised. And again, that's um, a good entry point for those who wish to move into a more research oriented or academic career. Uh, if you're thinking about a PhD after masters, then we encourage you to take this research component. And then we also have opportunities for those who are more interested in a more practically oriented degree to take an internship or to pursue some other electives. Um, and we have a lot of flexibility at this point for you to take courses from other departments um, around the, the ANU as well. And just to close, I guess, what uh, kind of career options or you know, what, what are the benefits of a degree in international relations? Uh, our students move into uh, government roles. They might also move into diplomacy. They could work in uh, non-governmental organizations, international organizations like the United Nations or World Bank. Um, they often, when you see their job applications, they look for people who have a master's degree in international relations is one of the requirements often. Um, journalism, academia um, is quite broad. And if you specialize in a particular area, um, for example, in, in peace and conflict studies or so on, then that gives you a, a unique background to enter into many of, um, of these particular uh, international organizations or INGOs that would be looking for such skills. So I think I've said enough about the program. I'm going to leave it there and hand it over for the Q&A. All right, thanks so much, Cecilia. That was excellent. Okay, everyone. So yeah, we're going to uh, turn our attention to some question and answers now. Uh, please feel free to keep them coming uh, throughout the, the rest of the session. Um, so I'm going to start off with one from Josh. Um, so this is for you, Lauren. Uh, the Master of Diplomacy sounds super interesting. Would this be suitable for someone with no background in social or political science? Yes, um, absolutely. We design the degree um, with the assumption that our students don't necessarily have, have a background in politics, international relations, or of course, diplomacy. Um, I will say though, it would probably be a lot um, easier for you if you have a a degree 
some kind of liberal arts degree background where you've been required to write essays and do analysis. I think it would be a little bit, well, it would be harder if you done say, I don't know, a quantitative degree in <laughs> really hardcore economics or um, mathematics or something like that. So yeah, we, we do assume no prior knowledge. And as long as you know how to write um, an essay, I think you'd, you'd be fine. Thanks, Lauren. And I, I assume that's uh, a similar sort of approach for everyone else as well. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no, um, there's no prerequisites for master's degrees at ANU, um, as long as you have an undergraduate degree uh, and you meet the GPA uh, mm -hmm. of five out of seven for all of these programs, you are more than welcome to apply. Um, if you do have the cognate uh, background, that's where you can start applying for things like credit. Um, okay, so there's another question here that I might quickly answer if that's okay. Uh, does the Master of Diplomacy uh, enroll international students? Absolutely, all of our degrees do. Um, international applications are currently open now uh, and they are open until uh, the 16th of November, but I would encourage you to apply as soon as possible. Um, and domestic applications will open on the 2nd of September. Uh, so we're one week away from that. And for any international students here, I'm going to post uh, a link in the chat for more information about international uh, application dates and things like that. Okay, next question. Uh, this is another one for Lauren. Uh, have you had graduates who have used the skills from the Master of Diplomacy outside of international organisations, uh, for example, in think tanks? Um, could maybe just have a chat about uh, maybe something yeah, that you've taught. Okay, it's, it's um, a, a very good question. Yeah, I mean, some of our graduates have gone on, I would say a lot of our graduates end up working in even just national government agencies, not necessarily Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, but also even defense, I mean, all kinds of departments. We've also had graduates end up working for non-government organizations. Um, some of them have even become leaders of those organizations. And even some, yes, have also worked in think tanks. We've got some who went on to do a PhD in diplomacy studies and ended up becoming academics. We have one working in South Korea in a university. Um, so I think, yeah, what's important to realize is that you, you will gain a, a broad skill set. And obviously having diplomatic skills <laughs> is useful in any kind of context, really, because in my own experience, what kind of makes people successful in any field of endeavor is being able to get along well with people that they work with. And obviously, yeah, learning diplomatic skills and, and some of the other skills you get from the degrees you've heard about tonight would definitely prepare you to have good writing skills, good communication skills, which would make you competitive um, in a range of yeah, workplaces, I think. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, I might stick to a similar theme and hand this one to Cecilia. Um, uh, I've also read that jobs in international relations uh, or international affairs generally are very competitive due to the large number of graduates compared to the size of the job market. Could you comment on this, please? Yeah, I mean, definitely it is. Uh, if you're looking at an organisation like the United Nations as well, you have to remember that there are quotas that are given for different countries. Uh, often it's important to build up your expertise. You know, a, doing a top degree is really important. Doing your graduate studies is really important um, because you are competing with other very highly qualified candidates. And it's also important that, um, I guess, people who are working for a career into international relations build up a skill base, take the opportunities to do internships, to volunteer, to take positions perhaps in smaller NGOs where you get to understand the field before you're applying for, you know, the big organisations, because it's really having that strong basis, both in your academic training, but also your career experience that shows your awareness. In international relations, as well as diplomacy and our other um, cognate degrees, it's also really important to be able to show that you understand the region, that you're attuned um, in terms of cultural sensitivity of how to engage with counterparts in other countries and, and other cultures and backgrounds. I think that is a strength that ANU, the Coral Bell in particular, um, really brings you know, across the suite of our degree programs as well. 
Thanks, Cecilia. Um, this is one for both Cecilia and Beth um, to answer, if that's okay. Uh, someone has asked, if I were to take a Master of International Relations, would it be possible for me to also take courses from um, Asian and Pacific Studies? Yes, I will. Um, I might have to leave that one over to one of our administrators. At the moment, I don't... I, we do have a range of other areas where you can take courses. Um, Beth, can I just ask you, are your course codes Asia? Um, as yes. The, yeah. yes, okay. So yes, you can take up to 24 units of courses from the MAPS program, there you go. Yeah, and so and the MAPS program is similar that the electives, you can take courses from anywhere across the ANU, so you can have specialties outside of, of our program as such. I suppose generally all of our uh, postgraduate programs are designed to be uh, somewhat flexible because uh, you know we want our students to have um, uh, an opportunity to really go into depth in the areas that they want to. So uh, that's worth mentioning as well. Um, Cecilia, there's an administration question here, which you may or may not know. Um, and it's just regarding when the restructure will be finalized because it looks like the old uh, version on the website? Yes, the old version is on the website. My understanding is within the next two days, this um, process should be finished. It just, it is a, just a process of uploading it onto the website. So this will take effect from the first semester uh, in 2021. So anyone applying for the program now would be starting on the, the new revised um, program that I showed to you. I'm just not sure how long it takes from the IT end for the new course structure to be visible on the website. Cool, thank you. Um, does anyone want to uh, speak generally about, um, well, actually, there's a question here about whether any of these degrees are available fully online uh, before and after COVID. Um, does anyone want to talk about uh, the situation at the moment with online study? So I can say something about that. I mean, so initially of uh, our program was not available online at all. And then when COVID hit, we made a dramatic um, and very sudden transformation to teaching completely online, which is what um, uh, universities across Australia and indeed across the world have done. So it's an interesting question. We haven't yet got there in terms of like talking about what the long-term implications are for how we um, are going to offer the course in future. Um, there are obviously a lot of advantages to being able to teach face-to-face -face and that sort of um, interaction and that sort of cohort effect that Bethwin um, talked about, that um, interchange, informal interchange that students um, uh, can have by, you know, meeting in a, in a class and, um, you know, interacting on a, on a sort of a face-to-face level. I've been personally surprised by how smoothly the, um, the online teaching has gone and how um, uh, you're able to reproduce most elements of the learning experience online very effectively. And I'm just being very frank with you there that it's been, uh, that it, w when it all happened, it was, a, it was a sort of a bit of a, you know, a nightmare scenario for us, but in fact, it worked out pretty well. But what students talk about missing is more those informal interactions. So we haven't yet had the conversation about what the long-term consequences would be. Um, and I don't know about the other programs, but I think it is a, it is a discussion that's gonna come up more and more into the future. Thanks, Ed. Um, so, and I should add as well, um, for any up-to-date information, uh, please check the ANU uh, COVID webpage, which I will find and put in the chat because that is our source of truth. That is something that is updated regularly. So uh, if you're looking for up-to-date information, that's the place to go. So I'll post that shortly. Um, there's a final question here. We've, everyone, we've got about uh, eight minutes left. So uh, if you, you still do have time to post some questions, if you like, this is the last one for now. Uh, and it's regarding uh, continuing on for a PhD. Um, so I think uh, Cecilia and Lauren both mentioned this. 
this question is about whether uh, there's a benefit to having an ANU master's degree uh, in terms of applying for a PhD um, as opposed to uh, master's degrees from other universities. Lauren, have you got uh, any info on that? Sure. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. So I think if you are planning to do a PhD, you can never start planning <laughs> too early <laughs> about how you're going to get there. And I think it's a really, it's something you need to take really um, seriously. So what you'll find with most of the degrees you've heard tonight, the ones that have a thesis option, the thesis is about, you know, 15,000 words um, on average, which is not a super long thesis. So, I mean, if you're planning to do a PhD, with a view to becoming an academic, you may even want to look into options of doing a research master's that's much more research intensive. But I would even say, I mean, these days with the academic job market being so competitive, it may even be strategic to do, as I actually personally did, you know, one of our sort of coursework masters, and then perhaps even a research masters, then a PhD, because like um, Ed's, Ed's program, the Master of Political Science, like the, the sort of skills learning how to do research through coursework are invaluable um, for then doing high level research. But I think you need to check the, the requirements for whatever PhD program you're aiming at because some of them require a longer thesis, right? So it's really important to, to think ahead. In terms of what an ANU degree would mean, ANU, in my experience, is the most recognised Australian university internationally. You know, I find even in the US or other countries um, I've been to that they tend to know ANU um, more than other universities. So I, I think it, it would definitely <laughs> not hold you back in any way. It would be an advantage. And I've also found through my experience that if you're planning to do a PhD in Asian studies abroad, again, ANU is known as the, the main university um, with, with the greatest sort of pool of expertise in that area. So yeah, I'm not sure if my colleagues want to add something. So, I mean, I would just say that, that getting into PhD programs is really competitive. So um, we wouldn't discriminate against people from non-ANU backgrounds, but what university you got your um, uh, previous degree in does count. It's one of the things that we would take, uh, that we would look at. Um, I, do you have a master's degree from a university that has a strong research reputation in the field for which you're applying for it? Um, admission into a PhD program and then we look at everything else your marks do you have publications uh, reference letters and all those sorts of things so I would agree with Lauren that the ANU has a very good reputation internationally and is therefore a, you know if you perform well in a in a uh, uh, you know in the research-based component of your, of your master's program in particular you know it's a good stepping stone Thanks, Ed. Um, are you happy with that, Cecilia and Beth? All good? Yep. All right, everyone. So look, we've, uh, we're pretty much out of time. Um, I just wanted to let you know that uh, Dr. Lauren Richardson posted a really great uh, article about uh, how to build a career in, in international affairs and foreign relations. Uh, she posted it in the Q&A, which unfortunately you can't uh, click on links there, so I've reposted it in the chat. So please have a look at that article. Um, so look, that's going to wrap it up from everyone tonight. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it was really great to have a really engaged audience and lots of questions coming through. Um, so I, yeah, we'll leave it there. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Bethan Evans, uh, Dr. Cecilia Jacob, Dr. Lauren Richardson and Professor Ed Aspinall for their time. We are very, very appreciative. Uh, and look, I've got lots and lots of um, links and email addresses and things in the chat box. So I'm going to hang around for a couple of minutes and make sure because after I close this session, that chat box will leave, uh, will, will close down and you'll lose all those links. So I'll hang around and make sure everyone has access to what they need. Uh, but for now, I will give our um, academics a three minute early mark and thank them very much for their time. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Good luck.
And um, I can just add about that article I shared. It's an article written by former ANU Chancellor Gareth Evans. Um, and as you know, or some of you may know, he was a former foreign minister of Australia. And so he's given some great advice about how you can pave a career in this fairly competitive um, area of international affairs. So it's, it's a really good article. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you.